Bang. I think when you get a little gray anywhere, whether for me it's my chin, for you it's the temple, like you just start wanting to dress better. It's partly, yeah. Because like, I need like, to make my clothing match this. Yeah. Well, also because gray hair with slaven outfit is homeless, right? Yeah. <laughs> Like or vet, not, or war vet. Or, yes, uh, often, uh, sadly, the same thing, right? Like, you know. Oh, so, so when it's, because you're, if you're slovenly dressed and young, it's, oh, it's an up-and-comer, he's still working his way up in the world. Yeah. If you look or old, speak, yeah. it's like, he's on his way down. Well, yeah, yeah, you just run out of, there's no more runway. Yeah. To, to the grunge, yeah. Look, right? Wait a minute, yeah. so when, Is when did an EDM you... look? What's an EDM? Well, Electronic dance music, old man. <laughs> oh, no, that's like... like and I'm the only one here without gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> you die. I know you do. I, I, I'll tell you, I have three gray hairs. Two on this side and one on this side. And I have never pulled them out because mm. I feel like they're weeds. You pull one out, then a bunch <laughs> more spring up in its place. Is that a real thing? I don't know. No, it's not, but it's tempting to believe. I mean, I'm practically blonde at this point because I'm trying so hard to hide gray hair. <laughs> like, I just keep putting in highlights, and at some point, I'm going to be a blonde. My wife has more gray hair than I do. Yeah. I like gray hair. I think it looks good. I love it. I love it on Matt. It, Matt, you bastards, you always look better with gray hair. So now I, I think I, I should get a touch of gray. Personal choice. I think, no, it's, I think gray it's hair in absolutely, ladies looks awesome. Uh, it's, it's unfair. Yeah, thanks, Justin. So, um, Justin is my favorite feminist. <laughs> it's true. So the, there's a kid I went to high school with who's also named Justin, who I posted the contender video, the me dancing video. Mm -hmm. And he just writes, I'm not a fan of gray hair, but your gray wings make me want to bum you like an altar boy. Oh, what? my. Oh, my. Well, I'm we're live in one minute, sentence. ladies and gentlemen. Like, I, I was made fairly uncomfortable by that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, again, we're not, like, friends, right? Like, like we knew each other in high school. Yeah, that's not okay. Yeah. That's not okay. Yeah. Uh, on that note, should hey, we start Yeah, the I guess show? it's one thirty. <laughs> All right. Two for, two for DTNS for J, JRY today. Well... <laughs> That you know of. Yeah. We secretly recorded maybe a show for December 30th earlier. Maybe. I don't know. Did we? <laughs> you a cop? Here we go. Podcasts about technology in your daily lives. From people who like to put pants on frogs. And one guy with a trustworthy looking beard. The Daily Tech News Show with Tom Merritt is brought to you by you and I at dailytechnewsshow.com slash donate. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, December 3rd, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, Mr. Justin Robert Young, DTNS contributor, independent podcaster extraordinaire. We, I kind of wish Patrick was here to say extraordinaire in French. He says it so well. How you doing, Jerry? Well, it's because they invented the word. Don't give him too much credit. You know, that <laughs> says it so well. Uh, yeah, no, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing fantastic. I am officially a, uh, a, an independent podcaster. That's uh, all you are. You are not, I'm an independent podcaster by day and a, a corporate analyst for financial tech firms by night. None of that. None of that. Oh, uh-uh. I am just here for you folks to deliver the tech news. You live and die by their whims. Indeed. So uh, please don't go all like Mad King Ares Targaryen. <laughs> Start uh, torturing me for your own place. You would know nothing, Justin Robert Young. Uh well, we got, we got headlines. We're going to talk about some stories. We've even combined a couple of stories to ask a, a internal question about whether we are facing open source nirvana or hubris from corporations. But let's start yeah. with the headlines. SP Sheridan was excited about Apple making good on its promise to open source Swift 2.0 by the end of 2015. Apple has launched Swift.org 
and released a large portion of Swift 2.0 code to the public under an Apache 2.0 license on GitHub. This includes the compiler, LLDB debugger, the REPL command line environment, libraries, and some supporting code. Swift.org features bug reporting and tracking, mailing lists, an engineering blog, guidelines, tutorials, documentation, stuff like that. Initial releases from Apple work on OS 10 and Linux, but because it's open source, we're expecting people to make it work on other platforms as well. Swift creator Chris Latner will oversee the project. All right. Um, I, I know enough about programming languages to make me dangerous, but not enough to really be insightful. So help me out here. Is Swift something that has been used tremendously and will see a greater yeah. benefit? Swift is what people are using now to create their iOS apps rather yeah. than Objective-C in many cases uh, because Apple would like them to do that, please. And what this could do is allow people to create Swift apps for other platforms. Yeah. Uh, it, it won't be able to do that right out of the gate, but that, that is a possibility here. It also, and, and the other thing that this Wired article makes very clear, uh, can allow people to do some back-end coding in Swift on whatever platform they're running their server on. Uh, and so they only have to code in one environment for both the app that's on iOS and any supporting software that they're doing on their own side. Uh, well, I mean, that's good. I mean, I, I feel like people have, have responded pretty well to it. I, I'm curious to see where it goes now that it has been released uh, into the wild, bird-like. It has uh, spread its wings. I love that now that it's open source, Justin you'll be able to tailor Swift to whatever needs you have. Uh, well, you know, uh, and, and for Apple, they have told Swift that we are never, ever, ever getting back together. Uh, Yahoo Messenger has been revamped and launched for iOS, Android, Web, and inside Yahoo Mail. The new Messenger focuses on group chats and integrates Flickr, Tumblr, and Sh Shobney? Jobney? Jobney. I, I always say Jobney. Jobney? Jubni. Uh, users. Sent Russian. Jubni. Jubni. Uh, users can send hundreds of photos quickly by using Flickr and deliver low-res previews while the full-res version loads. You can also write messages uh, while offline, unsend messages, and search Tumblr for gifts. Smart contacts powered by Jubni will offer suggestions for recipients. The new Yahoo Messenger is available for iOS and Android today with mail integration rolling out over the next month just in time for the board to message each other on whether or not they're for sale. <laughs> should we sell the Alibaba stock or should we keep the Alibaba stock and sell the rest? I don't know, man. Here's a Flickr image. Exactly. I found a funny Tumblr GIF. Yeah, uh, I, th I think um, this is a really cool messenger app, especially the Flickr stuff where you can send like a ton of, of, of images and they show up right away. They show up fast, yeah. much faster than any other messenger app because they don't have to send the entire thing with the Flickr backend. They can just send a preview and load everything. It's, a, it's nicely done. It's going to be really hard for people to, to get people to stop using WhatsApp or, or WeChat or whatever they're using and switch over to Yahoo Messenger though. But isn't that what we've kind of found over the last five years is that the most successful messengers aren't necessarily the king of all messengers for which everybody goes on. Uh, like the, the, the best and most successful messengers are the one that kind of can plug into multiple things or are where you are normally. Facebook Messenger has been successful because A, it's already in Facebook, and B, it's a good product that delivers messages faster than SMS and, and gives you a few more options in the same way that WeChat and WhatsApp do. So Yahoo Messenger, I suspect, will be as successful as Flickr, Yahoo Mail, and Tumblr are. You yeah. know, if, if, they, if they are a good product within those things, then you'll see cross-traffic. Yeah, and, and those things are of varying popularity. Tumblr is extremely popular. Uh, Yahoo Mail, more popular than you probably want to let yourself think. And, yes. and, and, and so including Messenger as an integration in there is going to be a smart move. Uber's testing a smart move, I think. Uh, it's a system in Seattle that lets you pick a color that will glow from a light strip on the Uber driver's windshield as they get close to your location. And then you can also choose to light up your phone screen with the same color so the driver knows it's you. On a, on a dark day, if you're looking for your car, it makes it a lot easier than trying to make out the license plate number. You know, 
in an era before I was a professional podcaster, and I was just a listener to podcasts, uh, many of which starred Tom Merritt, uh, and I would just say, man, I hate it when all these fancy pants, Bay Area, big city tech pundits just talk about all the hassles and problems that happened in their fancy pants, tech rich, big cities. Uh, I would hate the fact that I'm about to say, this is amazing because there's too many Ubers on the streets of San Francisco and Oakland that I have often found myself getting into another car because there are two Uber cars waiting or one that is waiting on a corner for somebody else that is not my Uber. I have done this repeatedly. People have tried to get into my car despite the fact that I don't have an Uber sticker on. So any other way that you can physically identify rider and car is amazing. Look, man, I, I'm in a small desert town in Southern California. I don't have those issues. I've never had that happen to me here. Uh, but I understand, you know, that's, it's different up there. Stop it. Go back to Silver Lake, you hipster. <laughs> now we're doing L.A. local jokes. Facebook has opened up its live video streaming to a small percentage of users on iOS in the United States. The service, which has been launched for selected participants, notifies close friends of the broadcast. Videos are automatically saved and remain permanently visible. If you have the feature, you'll find it in the drop-down from update status. Facebook has launched a way to sh also launched a way to share multiple photo and video titles called Collage. Collage, yeah. I think Collage is there for everybody uh, to try. Not everybody's going to have this. Before, only celebrities and journalists had the live broadcasting. So now uh, any, anybody could have it. They're just releasing it to a, a small percentage. You don't have to pr prove you're famous or a blogger or writing for TechCrunch or anything like that. So um, I, it is interesting to see Facebook putting it into the Facebook app because this is the kind of thing where they could get it to catch on because they're not insisting on spinning things out like Messenger into another app, but they're putting it inside the app and saying, hey, when you're putting your status, maybe your status is live and happening right now. Just Periscope, I mean, Facebook Live it right now. So that is a very, very interesting distinction because theoretically, the Facebook-owned app for which you have your camera out the most is Instagram. Right? Like, they're, they're, you know, Facebook is very, very good and has been very, very good and smart with video, uh, or at least getting it out to people. Whether or not you want to watch this kind of content on Facebook is very, very interesting. I mean, I think we both know for a fact that they have some very, very smart live video encoding people that work there that are doing very interesting things. But Facebook also has a checkered history about these, you know, uh, Kmart versions of, of popular apps. They seem to kind of try all of them and uh, just see which ones shake out and which ones don't. I, I don't know whether or not this is Facebook content, but interesting that they put it inside instead of what Twitter did with Periscope. Well, I get where Facebook's going with this, which is we're not making a Periscope competitor or they would put it out as a separate app. They're saying sometimes when you're about to write your status and say, oh my gosh, there's a fence on fire by my house. Instead, you might go, oh wait, I can actually just choose to show it. And that video will stream to my friends who are watching now and it'll be available for them to watch later. But does this ultimately help or hurt Facebook's video dreams, right? Because what they have done successfully is get so much attention and, and push their video so hard that they have kind of created a genre of video, specifically ones that are short, have the words on them so you can watch them without sound, uh, and are very, very advantageous to companies like BuzzFeed, Tech Insider, that kind of you know, that, that, that breed of video maker. I kind of uh, think they're two different strategies, though. They're well, both video, but they're different. But one dilute the other. Mm. If, if, I don't if think you so. Are getting, if you are getting your friends poorly produced video, that, again, live video from your phone is not meant to be edited and, and shaved down. There's supposed to be a raw voyeuristic uh, element to it. Does that reduce your likelihood mm. to want to take the chance to even hover on an autoplay video? I don't know. And this only goes to your to your friends too. So you're going to be yeah, more invested in everyone, that video because you're like, oh, that's from Justin. So I'll watch it. But everyone is somebody's friend, Tom. <laughs> I'm not Tom's friend.
Open Whisper Systems has released a beta version of a web version of their messaging app Signal. According to PC World, the beta is a plugin for Google's Chrome web browser and will sync and encrypt messages between it and an Android device. So it pairs, basically. It uses your Android device to, to tell if the message is coming in and then displays it in the web browser. It does not yet work with iOS, uh, but they do want to have that compatibility eventually. Uh, it also won't support voice yet. You can ask to join the beta at whispersystems.org slash blog slash signal dash desktop. We'll have that in the show notes as well. The iOS and Android versions of Signal feature end-to-end -end encryption for voice messaging and photo sharing. If you didn't know, Signal is a free and open source app. How much... How much uh, traffic does Signal see? Uh, quite a bit, as far as I know. Quite a bit? Yeah. Lots of folks using the Signal these days. So, what, I mean, is, is this... Who, who do you know? Who, is, who, are, who are the Signal customers? Like, like Edward like, Snowden, obviously, Justin. Sure. All right. So, so people who are, are cognizant of, uh, you know, how much we are at, at risk privacy-wise. But, but this is a... Would it be safe to say... And, and, activist app and i don't mean people who are just like uh, uh you know uh, no i yell about it but people who are sensitive to these things i think it used to be an activist app and that's how it got popularized when edward snowden said yes i use signal uh, i think a lot more people are using it now beyond that crowd it is not massively popular it's a, that's a fair point um so, so, but where are you going? Because you're right. It is, it is, it is not a mainstream app that your your everyday folks are using. But there are quite a few people using it, uh, and I think that hence the pressure to say like, hey, you know, it's really nice on text messaging when I can answer and reply to them on my laptop like I can with Windows and I can with OS yeah. X. Could I do that with Signal? And and that's and that's great because what we ultimately want, right, is for more apps to take seriously what Signal takes seriously. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. The information reports that, quote, people in the mobile industry, unquote, who I am so looking forward to their Coachella set this year, uh, tell them that Andy Rubin is trying to record, uh, recruit people for a venture that would develop a new Android handset. Rubin, of course, co-founded Android before Google acquired it and then left Google one year ago. Yeah, last fall. A little more than a year, I guess, by uh, at this point. Um I don't want anyone to make any more phones. That's a horrible thing to say. Of course we want no, more phones. I we mean, want competition. And Andy Rubin, I, I think the reason I was willing to put this story in the story in the headlines today is like, gosh darn it, if somebody can make a phone that will interest me again, it's Andy Rubin. Uh, and and uh, a man who, uh, you know, certainly is, is, is no stranger to game-changing phone uh physical phone manufacturing right he's one of the names behind the sidekick which i mean let's let's go ahead and crank the way way back machine Kids before touch screens you know there was one hip phone why we all went 23 skidoo and flipped up our sidekicks <laughs> and texted all of our friends where's the ecstasy we would say as we listened to our chemical brothers back in the 20s yeah <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. No, I, I, I think you're right. I, I, Andy Rubin, uh, I'd be very interested to see if this ends up being true and he ends up uh, launching a company. He's, he's running his own incubator right now, so it could come right out of that. Uh, he could fund it himself. Uh, I'd be interested to see what they came up with. Maybe it'll be like a Sidekick Android hybrid that we've never really seen. Like the Sidekick was bought by Microsoft before they ever owned Nokia and just died. Just yeah, died. And, and, and the funny thing is, is that I feel like we're actually in... A really a really fun place where like you could get a radical form factor phone like much in the same way that, that the sidekick kind of totally went left from the candy bar uh, you know cell phone uh, form factor now pretty much all smartphones kind of look exactly the same with very very minor button placement change if there was something radically different that could also affect uh, your usability of it I feel like that'd be really rad we're in a great place for that uh, Google, as we told you a while back, has been experimenting with streaming an app from search results so you could try it out when you see it show up in search results. And now uh, it's offering a way for advertisers to stream an app within another app uh, when their ad shows up in that second app. Ads come through Google's ad mob service. Recode reports one ad type called trial run lets users try out an app for a minute. 
uh, without having to download. So if you're playing a game, for instance, and you see an ad for another game, you could tap to try that other game and see if you would like it and, and then download it if you do. Uh, the second ad type works in full screen or interstitial ads, I think, to just make them more dynamic. Yo, dog, I heard you like apps. <laughs> Got apps in your apps now. Yeah. Uh, I think this is interesting because of the attempt to solve a problem that the web doesn't have, which is how to link one thing to another and show it up. I mean, we've been doing frames since the 90s, but apps just don't really have an easy way to do that. No, and this is something that we're going to talk a little bit more in our discussion topic. But uh, So I'll, I'll save some of my blazing hot takes, but very, very interesting and also very, very Google. Hmm. OnePlus is permanently making its OnePlus 2 phone available without an invite starting at midnight December 5th. The more affordable OnePlus X will be available without an invite temporarily from December 5th through December 7th. So get on your horse and ride. Yeah, the public service message from Daily Tech News Show. Uh, Eisting recommends reading an Ars Technica report on the town of Stewart, British Columbia, that right now barely has internet and has no cell phone coverage. The town's one wireless provider, a nonprofit called OneWayOut.net, I double-checked that to make sure it wasn't fake. It seems to be real. Uh, reportedly discontinued service at the end of November after being in business since 1995. It was a nonprofit, mind you, and it just could not make a go of the expensive proposition anymore. Residents can now access the internet only through satellite or dial-up, and the phone company TELUS is expediting a project to connect the town to fiber, but they say that'll still take 8 to 12 weeks. Meanwhile, all the movie critics reviewing this uh, sure-to-be horror film uh, have all said, two on the nose. Yeah. A rural town that loses the internet and is invaded by aliens. And cell phone coverage. It's right? Story. Like, you know, let's just say, if you were somebody with bad intentions in, in Stewart, British Columbia, like, you know, this is when everything happens, uh, just, just leave. Just go. Just everybody head to Vancouver. Pile in the minivan. Go to Vancouver for a couple of weeks. You're going to come back. It's going to be great. It's like when you stay at your friend's house while your new apartment is getting cable and internet hooked up. <laughs> so you're suggesting that the entire town of Stewart uh, should just stay over at Vancouver while TELUS puts in fiber? I mean, would you rather be... I mean, like, uh, this is... They have landlines. It's not like they're cut off from the outside world. Uh, I mean... Listen, you you can uh, you can have your definition of uh, livability, and I can have mine. I'm trying Fair to enough. look up uh, whether or not how far Stewart is from Vancouver, because these are the only thing I know is British Columbia. And how big can that be? Yeah, I mean, it only reaches all the way to the Arctic Circle. <laughs> Engadget reports that Google has developed an app that allows Android phone users to take what they call VR photos. The cardboard camera app uses a panorama photo, which the app then turns into a 360-degree 3D image using the stitching technology from Google's Jump VR platform. The app is available today on Google Play stores in 17 languages. Tom, will anybody ever actually use this? Yes, absolutely. People are going to use this for photos and have fun with it, and then it will die away in popularity. But... Here's what I think is in interesting about this. Google able to port at least some of the technology from Jump into a consumer app means that we are seeing the beginning of the meeting of those two things. Jump is an incredibly expensive professional platform. We talked about Nokia's Ozo platform uh, the other day and how expensive that is. We're talking about tens of thousands of dollars with these things. And we're like, is there a way for us to do this with the technology we have? Well, here's one example. It's not video. It's just, just a still image at this point, but it's a step, right? Sure. I mean, you might as well, Joe. I Bill Clinton you there. Uh, uh, also, 17 hours from Stewart to Vancouver, worth it. TechCrunch reports that Google.org has awarded a million-dollar grant to the Wayfinder project. If you look it up, there's no E in Wayfinder. They couldn't find it. Uh, which uses low-power Bluetooth beacon technology to help blind and visually impaired people navigate indoor spaces. It's, it's really cool. It just gives you audio directions. Like, okay, go, go forward a few feet 
and you'll find stairs, go downstairs. That's the way to the entrance to, to the tube stop. Uh, the goal is to create an open standard for indoor audio navigation instructions and optimized arrangement of Bluetooth low energy beacons. Project is being developed by the Royal London Society for the Blind and Monument Valley game creator Us2 and already has a pilot program. Uh, they tested it out at the Pimlico station earlier this year. They're testing it out right now at the Houston station of the London Underground. The hope is to have version one of the standard available in early 2016. This is amazing. Uh, I, I, I love, number one, I, 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 am, I am, count me among the people that long for the more robust audio only internet, you know, and, and I think that the disability issues are just one simple way that you can continue to make that better. Yeah, I, I think this is fantastic and uh, good on us too for, for being involved in it. Not us too, but the no. company, us too. Them to us too. <laughs> good on them, called us too, uh, for doing this. Go go take a look at the at the project, uh, at the Wayfinder project site too. Uh, it's, it's really interesting how this works. Uh, I, I, I think uh, this is a good example of accessibility and technology working together. Awesome. And finally, the Let's Encrypt project for free HTTPS certificates has entered public beta. The joint uh, project between EFF and Mozilla can be found at letsencrypt.org. Yeah, go get your free cert right now. Let'sencrypt.org. Uh, and thanks to everybody who submits stories on our subreddit. That's how we found out about the town in British Columbia of Stuart. Uh, thanks to Eisting. Lots of good stuff in there. Please go submit stories or at very least vote. Stop in for a minute and say, ah, it looks good. That looks good. That doesn't look good at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. And that is a look at the headlines. All right. So we had the story. Uh, about Google and the apps in your apps streaming for ads. And Mark Bergen on Recode wrote, in Google's ideal world, a mobile app is not a closed space, but an open one, a layer for services that can easily connect with one another, like the web, uh, which I would say, why don't we work on making the web do that then? Uh, apps are siloed. There is no drag and drop in the app world. Uh, if, you're, if you're using an iPad, you're using an Android tablet, uh, you, you, even, even if you're using Windows in tablet mode, you can't very easily and almost never drag one thing to another uh, because everything is separated off. Google's trying to eject some fluidity to that. Apps can do more than HTML. I get that because of the code they're written in. And that brings us to the other story we talked about today, Apple open sourcing Swift. Cade Metz from Wired says, the upshot of this project is that coders are free to build and run Swift applications on a wider range of machines. They can run Swift code on both the consumer devices we hold in our hands and the computer servers that deliver the data and services to these devices. So we're seeing pressure from coders to build cross-platform. We are seeing Google from within saying we need to figure out a way to go across the boundaries of these silos. The pressure from users and developers is always there to make the thing you want to use run the things you want to use on it. Uh, the question has always been, will the makers of those things respond to that? And we're seeing that in these two cases. But Justin, do you think these grand visions are pointing the way forward? Whether or not, and I think that you are absolutely right, that every app that I get the most use out of, including those that are hard-baked into uh, OS X and iOS and stuff like that, are ones that go cross-platform. There's a reason why I like my Apple Watch specifically for messaging, and uh, with my new MacBook Pro, I can seamlessly, you know, uh, from any number of devices, I can continue to message, right? Uh, uh, Wonderlist for me has uh, an amazing Chrome plugin. It's got a great iOS uh, uh, client, and, and that way I can continue to have the best possible service. So I think the idea of things going cross-platform is, if not inevitable, uh, certainly going to continue to speed up. What I would like to comment on is Google's grand visions, because this is a company that has, at least twice to my knowledge, had very, very grand unifying visions of the future that they bet very big on, and in many times had either their biggest missed opportunities or their biggest blunders come as part of it. Uh, let's go back to the idea of Chrome as an operating system. Uh, in, in uh, I believe it's the, the book In the Plex. It is described that Google 
uh, believed that the uh, the era of the hard drive was going away. Sure. That we were in 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 near term future, the idea of uploading files uh, was going to be uh, passe. So much so that they had uh, they neglected and and uh, decided to go to not do what the long rumored G drive because everybody thought Google infinite storage space. Why don't they just let us upload stuff? The idea of of uh, uh, you know online storage was hot at the time. They said no, we don't want to do G drive. Uh, you know, and, and they eventually did years and years later, but they, because they believe that everything that you really, really needed, you'd be able to get off a central repository now in this uh, omni-internet connected web. That, that decision led for companies like Dropbox and Box and, and everything else that has come after there uh, to thrive. This was a grand unifying vision for Google. Another one was Facebook. Facebook overtaking them. The great green wave, as it was called, uh, that they needed to create a social layer over all their platforms so they could continue to collect this kind of data because they were never going to get it from Facebook. That became Google+. That's something that's currently, uh, you know, being rejigged. Being adapted. Uh, there's lots of Google+, Plus users, and they still use it for groups, and, and Google's leaning into that. They're They're... And, and they use it for the things, but Google's saying, yeah, okay, we see that the groups thing is getting some traction. We'll lean into that. But you're right. It did not overtake Facebook. So whenever Google gets into these, we, we are Google. We have, we have decided the future. We, we're, we're going to lead into it. I always, or and now, I kind of take it with a grain of salt because they, they have, listen, they bet big. You know, there is no doubt about it. Like when, when they, and, and who knows whether or not Google now, under new leadership, and, and and not the, the direct Larry and Sergey leadership that they've had before uh, is going to be different on, on some of this kind of stuff. But I just kind of wonder whether or not uh, we are going to see some friction from app creators who are not necessarily thrilled by some of the uh, the the you know Google's uh, machinations on this, whether or not like we're going to see friction because this is where people tend to kind of rub up against Google when Google feels like they're doing something for the larger righteous purpose. Yeah. Except they're doing it in ads. That's the only thing that makes me, that's the only thing that comes to mind when I hear that argument is like, yeah, remember Google wave, uh, even Gmail when it started, it was going to be like, no folders. We don't need folders, right? Lots of high concepts. But when Google does ads, uh, they tend to do it right. And they tend to do it in the way that the advertisers want. And so that's the difference with the ad mob thing is, hey, if you want to advertise your app and emulate it or, or, or let people try it, you can do that. It puts all the control in the advertiser. And advertisements is something where they generally haven't had that over grand vision. Uh, at, you know, and so the search results... I think you have to be a participant and say, yeah, it's okay if my, my app does that, at least for now. So I, and I assume that Google will continue that. So they might not get too much friction from app makers unless it's the friction of, I really don't like that people are doing this. I just want people to download my app. I don't want them to feel like they could try it. Same, it's, so I don't know that Google is being grand concept in this particular case. Uh, I, I think this is more responding to an advertiser need as well as responding to the limitations of the mobile web. And the, the mobile web side is where they could be maybe accused of being too grand, but I think they're just solving a problem that apps is fundamentally have. And, and you may be right that it doesn't end up taking off, but it may just lead to us saying, we really need to make a version of HTML, maybe HTML6, maybe you can do it in HTML5, that gives us all of the things that we get out of apps while allowing that cross-platform compatibility that HTML has. And, and, and again, there are a lot of amazing tenants to what they want to do, including, and the Recode goes into this, their, their religious fanaticism in terms of reducing latency. So, so you, you do not get a degraded app performance when you stream it, you get what feels like a native app performance when you stream it. Uh, and, and that's something that I think uh, nobody would argue that like, yes, no, Google, please don't uh, improve the concept of latency in terms of streaming things. Yeah, and, and maybe open sourcing Swift isn't the silver bullet for this, but there are more languages than just Swift 
that are open sourced and being used in this manner. And those languages are showing that, hey, we actually want a cross-platform situation that we can use in lots of different places. So whether it's Rust or Go or D or maybe Swift, uh, maybe one of them ends up becoming that thing that I'm talking about that integrates into HTML, which, you know, it's just a markup language. It's, it, it's not really designed to do a lot of stuff. JavaScript yeah. has carried all of the heavy programming uh, for a long time and derivatives of that. So I, 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 I feel like these two things, neither one, I think you're absolutely right. Neither one of these things are the, are the grand vision, the, the grand solution, but they are signposts. They are pointing that like, hey, people want to go that direction. And I think more people may take that hint. I mean, this is, again, to go back to the Recode article, in Google's ideal world, this is a quote, in Google's ideal world, a mobile app is not a closed space, but an open one, a layer of services that can easily connect like, uh, with one another like the web. Uh, that's, that's what they want to do. And, and all I'll say is that this is where Google tends to start stepping on toes if they believe that they are only five degrees away from the future and they have the power within their own system to get themselves there. Let's get to our pick of the day. Jesse from Indianapolis has a pick called I Shows 2, which he calls the best TV show tracking app available on iOS. It's a universal app. May not be as feature rich as some other apps in the category, but it does a lot of things very well, including finding shows to add your, to your list, keeping tabs on all of your shows, and when they are or have aired, including push notification support, tracked.tv integration for sync, multiple customization options, a today widget for your notification center, and 3D touch support. Best of all, the app is a joy to navigate and interact with. Full disclosure, I'm a beta tester, says Jesse, and I have been for most of the year, but seeing as I was a fan of iShows 1 well beforehand, hope this removes any conflict of interest. Simply put, if you need an app to track your shows, Jesse highly recommends downloading iShows 2 and giving it a shot. It's free on the App Store for tracking three shows and $3.99 if you want to go past that. So it's got a little paywall in there. But it gives you a chance to try it out and see if you like it before you pay. Uh, with Peak TV, as everyone's calling it, uh, these kinds of apps are more and more useful for a lot of people. So this is, you know, let's say I like the Nick, right? And, uh, and, and so this helps me know when it comes on or... Yeah. When are new episodes coming out? Oh, crap. I forgot. I forgot to set my, my DVR. The Haven, Haven season premiere happened and I missed it. That kind of stuff. Gotcha. Gotcha. Rad, man. Send your picks to us, folks. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. You can find my picks at DailyTechNewsShow.com slash picks. A couple messages of the day. Uh, Jonathan, the unofficial DTNS facilities manager and co-executive producer from Ottawa, Canada, wrote in, and, and a separate person who is a co-executive producer from Ottawa, Canada, wrote in, uh, talking about us discussing Thunderbird and how Mozilla is indicating they want to separate Thunderbird away into its own project. Uh, Scott particularly was like, how many people are using Thunderbird? And uh, our emailer says, at work, I use Linux on my desktop, and internally we have Microsoft Exchange for email. It does have IMAP and SMT enabled, so I use Thunderbird as my email client under Linux. There are probably not that many people in the same boat as me, but Thunderbird is definitely my best option as a Linux email client. And then Jonathan uh, works at Oracle and says, you know, they give us the option to, in fact, they encourage us to use OpenOffice and Thunderbird. You can apply for a Microsoft Office li a license, but some employees stick with the free and open source options. Despite having a license to Outlook, I felt that Thunderbird was faster, easier, and provided better search capability. While it's different enough from Outlook that I'm sometimes disadvantaged, I'm happy with my choice. But he does say, my typical coworker, on the other hand, gets confused and asks what program I'm using whenever they come by my desk for help with something. So a couple Thunderbird users out there. I knew there would be. Oh, I mean, if, if you're going to find Thunderbird users, I think listeners to Daily Tech News podcasts are probably going to be the best place to head. And Sebastian from Germany said, I'd like to add something to the comment a listener made during DTNS 2637 about people living in the country and not getting all the new services. So he was, our emailer there was speculating, will we have an urban divide in these sorts of things? Eric Schmidt uh, from Alphabet, formerly known as Google, visited Sebastian's university yesterday. And during the session, he talked about future cities and such. Uh, 
Uh, Sebastian says, he expressed the opinion that in the near future, everything will happen in big cities. Cities will get denser, buildings will get taller. He said that after talking about a future of AI and self-driving cars and the sharing model for cars, the idea being that the cities become more and more attractive because of all these services and the ease of living. Thought that might interest the listeners and all. Feel free to summarize my mail. Oh, sorry, I read it all because it was too good. Uh, th he's got a reference here too to a, uh, a link that's in German. So if you read German, you might be able to, to read up a little more about what Eric Schmidt said. Uh, but yeah, furthering that idea of a big technology thinker saying, oh yeah, everybody just move into cities. Well, everybody may not want to move into cities. I, you know, there was, a, there was an amazing Kurt Vonnegut short story that, that has always stuck with me about the, the era where we are in one big mega city, right? And, and also we have effectively cured death and things are so, uh, so dense that everybody lives on top of one, each, uh, one another. Uh, and, and it's a great story. I wish I remember the name of it. Uh, and uh, it always stuck with me until I started doing lecture tours with Andrew Main and I had to drive through the vast majority of open space <laughs> for which we have in this uh, great country, and I'm sure it's similar in many, many others. And you kind of realize, wow, we've got a lot of places to spread. And, and uh, although Eric Schmidt, I think, makes some good points, and they're the reason why people move to cities, you know, they were when, when it was like, you know, uh, uh, public transportation and uh, publicly available electricity, uh, that's re the reason why people move to cities, because of creature comforts like that. And cities have gotten denser, but I don't think we've quite seen the everybody is flocking to the city center because of the advancement. Well, and it's, it's, it's attitudes like Eric Schmidt's, I think, that upset folks who do live in rural areas because, yes, while electricity brought a lot of people into the cities, it also required a rural electrification project in this country to bring the electricity out uh, into other areas. So sometimes you need to organize uh, and say, hold on, we need, we need you to bring some of those services here. And I guess it depends on what those services are. We, we're still trying to get internet. As the Stuart British Columbia yeah. uh, story showed, we're still trying to get internet out into those areas of many countries. So, uh, and of course, many countries need to be wired all together. And if you're interested in, in the sacrifices that people make for electricity, there's a great documentary about the Tennessee Valley Authority called Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? that you can, that you can watch. <laughs> you know, my uncle worked for the Tennessee Valley Authority. Really? Yeah. Well, he, he did not, uh, I don't think he ever got to watch Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? So, he wasn't bona fide. Yeah. Although he apparently the pattern familiar is though. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Justin Robert Young. Twitter.com slash Justin R. Young to follow Justin and his many projects, uh, all of which he will describe now in detail. Uh, all right. Just one. All right. Fine. Just one. Justin R. Young on Twitter. Follow me for everything. The contender is arriving at our Oakland uh, headquarters uh, uh, tomorrow. So if you are a Kickstarter backer at the highest level, we are going to lovingly pack up all of your uh, all of your stuff tomorrow. White glove service. Uh, oh, white glove uh, to the hilt. Uh, it's going to be great. Everybody else who backed on Kickstarter, the, there are other separate packages that are going to Amazon fulfillment facilities across the country. They will then be sent from there to your house. So you should. There is a very good chance that by the next time I talk to you, you could have the contender in your life. What? You don't have it ordered yet? Don't worry, friendo. I got you covered. Head on over to thecontender.us. We got the presidential party back, the 500 card base deck, as well as 60 custom buttons, including one button for every single topic. You can play in style with the presidential party pack available at thecontender.us. Let me tell you, I know people in the United States are, are, are into the election already. The election hasn't even started. Oh. primaries don't happen until next year. It's only going to get more fun if that's what you think it is. And it's certainly going to be more fun if you get the contender. Well, I mean, again, this is the, the game. It is a game designed for people that find politics puzzling, confusing, and often infuriating. You can inhabit the bodies of the uh, folks who deem themselves worthy to run for president. You, too, can feel the call of the office if you uh, go ahead and, uh, and, and buy the contender right now. Become a contender. Hey, uh, thank you for becoming a patron as well. Uh, we have 
analysts. We have co-executive producers. We have just nickel backers. Uh, be any of those at dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. You can find the links to our Patreon, our PayPal donation, or even our dailytechnewsshow.com store where you can find a lovely new DTNS mug as Ooh. well as uh, shirts and, and battery chargers and all kinds of cool stuff in there. And uh, if you are a backer at the $5 a month level, you get access to the treasure chest. And in the treasure chest today, uh, you get the full version of the DTNS pre-show and post-show, uh, which the pre-show today, if you're wondering why we're talking about a fence being on fire or what happened <laughs> or why Justin coined the term fire tax, uh, you'll have to go watch that. So if you're a patron, go check out the treasure chest. And thanks to everybody who supports our show. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern at alphageekradio.com and to diamondclub.tv. And visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. Back tomorrow with Darren Kitchen and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs> Bango. Bingo. Bingo. Hey, great show, everybody. What should we call it? <laughs> Still my line. Hmm. What should we call it? Jenny. I'm looking. I'm reading. All right. Well, the top vote getter is Apple gets Swifty. <laughs> Show uh, me what you code. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's one that I almost can't bear to read out loud. <laughs> but it's spelled Yahoo with a W H O. Who? Oh, hey guys, it's one of the top three Comscore sites on the internet. That's right. That's right. I've it's never seen a more Thunderbird. successful content <laughs> company get so crubbed on. I heard you like stream apps. Yeah. <laughs> 50 shades of Uber. I think there's only like six shades of Uber. Yeah. They're all gray. Because it's. Um, Take the red Uber. That's not a title, but it should be. That's good. I like Take that. Take the red Uber. I also like Apple gets Swifty though. Um. <laughs> I. What do you oh, like? What do you like, people? Cloud like? Appless. <laughs> I see you. That's pretty dang clever. That's pretty dang I, clever. I do like Get Swifty, though. Yeah. Unless we've already done a, a, a Get get Swifty. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we have. Not to my knowledge. Ah, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> Show me open source. <laughs> Show me your source code. <laughs> if anyone doesn't know what we're going on about you have to watch rick and morty that's all yeah. i can say all right and if you don't want to watch rick and morty don't worry about it you're not i mean it's whatever <laughs> just we just like it yarp empire strikes back pretend i'm dumb about star wars went up this morning Ooh, exciting I so far, the favorite line on Twitter is uh, finally getting back to the feel of the first three episodes. Nice. And we're levelated. Woo. Levelator. So we're, we've got two of our holiday episodes in the can. Uh, Jenny and Rich and Shane and is 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 anyone else helping you? I started naming people and realized. Uh, I on, the, me? on the best of. Yeah, that's it so far. Uh, yeah, so we're working hard on the best of, uh, and then we've got the analysts' quarterly show, which the analysts are all lined up for. 
from the analyst level on Patreon. And the um, Whatchama Show with the predictions. That's next week. Next, we'll, we'll record it next week. Yeah. yeah. Predictions ready, Justin? Um, no. And although this time I'm going to read all of them. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that reminds me, we should actually tell all our contributors, remind them that it's next week. Yeah. And then say, have two or three predictions. I should do that. That would be good. But where should I do it? Should I do it in Slack or should I do it in email? Email. Not Ugh. not every not all of them go to the Slack every day. I know. I want to end email. Jenny started a war on email. <laughs> all right, we're going with Apple gets Swifty. Seven votes. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. I got to get uh, back to the grind, but I will talk to you guys. All right, man. Bye. Good show. As always, friends, uh, a treat. You. See you later. Adios. Make sure nothing else burns in my neighborhood. Oh, my gosh, yeah. That's an act of faith. I'm gonna go do an internet show. Hope, hope nothing else. Well, I heard, I heard like yeah. uh, what sounded like a truck show up, but that's also normal behavior for this, uh, for this neighborhood. So it's probably just going to a construction something. But mm -hmm. I was like, are they tearing down that house already? No. You and I both had weird mornings because um, uh. All of a sudden, I heard massive gunfire in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. and I was That's like... That's disturbing. I was like, this is disturbing, but it doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound right. There were no follow-up sounds like ambulances or police mm -hmm. cars or helicopters, and nothing started showing up in any of the feeds, and I was like, well, what could it be? And I, everybody likes to bag on Twitter a lot, including me. But I did just go to Twitter and type in some, you know, Hollywood gunfire, and boop, there popped up a little tweet that says, hey, everybody, just wanted to let you know that NCIS LA is filming in Central Hollywood today. Uh, so, you know, if you hear gunfire, it's okay. A lot of people are still freaked out. And I was like, so my thoughts were, well, that was really useful information that I got on Twitter. And then my second thought was, you don't think they should have postponed that maybe a day? Just maybe people are a little on edge. But anyway, so I that was my morning. You, I had fake gunfire uh, repeated because, of course, you have to get the reverses. Uh, and then you had a fire. Yeah. Um, that is uh, – it's, it's been, been an interesting morning. What yeah. was really interesting to me is the dogs never budged. Like yeah. freaking UPS driver h hovers – in front of our house for too long and Sawyer goes off. But with none of this, did they ever hmm. they're like, eh. and I mean, I was like, that's what I was all partly comforted by that. Yeah. So. Um, I'll tell you day five of a cracked phone display is one day too many. I know people who just use cracked phone displays for ever. Like that's know. just their display. My friends do, but I'm just like, but I can't read the words. Mine isn't like a little cracked. Mine is like three separate crack points. Plus. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really just like whoomp, straight down. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen people with like starburst patterns. I'm like, how do you use that? You yeah. can't see anything. Oh, I, I figure it out. I work around also, it. Also, you get these little tiny pieces of, it's not shards of glass. <laughs> it's just that weird feeling that it might be shards of glass. Well, that's that. Who's the comedian who did the Apple commercial? Oh, was it uh, Apple commercial? Hodgman? No. No, 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 no. More, much more recent than that. Mm -hmm. um, um, doing a horrible job of explaining it. There was a Saturday Night Live guy uh, who he just left and he did a commercial for a phone. And it was, it was basically he had a cracked phone and he, he wasn't. Maybe it was for a carrier because it was about, maybe it was a T-Mobile commercial. Mm. And his oh, fingers were bleeding. Oh, it was a hater. Yes, thank you. And his fingers were bleeding because he was using his cracked phone. Bill Hader's my fave. And he could, didn't get the text message that his wife had to go to the emergency room. Yeah. And, yeah. I remember that. That's it. Don't be a hater unless you're Bill Don't Hader. Don't be a hater. Then be yourself. Burr, 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 burr.
I don't believe I don't believe the four inch iPhone expected to launch early twenty sixteen. I just don't believe it. Uh, it's pro- I'm probably wrong. I I'm just... so confused as to why we need all these different inches of phone. Is that for people with small hands? That's bargain. It's cheaper uh, to make. Okay. That's my guess. Hmm. You know, I really won't settle until the phone is in front of my eyes. You want the magic leap. I do. I actually really do. I am so excited to share my prediction next week about that. I thought you might be excited about this uh, this app for turning pictures into VR. Too. I am, actually. In fact, I, I, that was the first moment when I read that one where I was like, oh, I should have a phone. I should have a Samsung phone. And I should get the Gear VR. And like it clicked for me that I was like, oh, I should do that. Well, but you, yeah, I mean, this this app, you don't need a Samsung phone. You, no, you I do know. need an Android phone. Android. So you'd be killing two birds with one stone if you did. But I figured if you're going to get the Gear VR, you should probably get the Samsung phone, right? Well, or but does... the, Gear, the Gear VR only works with Samsung, but this this app was for cardboard. No, I know, I know. Okay, right. But I've, I'm thinking if I go all the way back into the Android universe, I should probably get the thing that works with the VR thing. Well, yeah. I mean, sure. That's my overarching big picture I'm thing. Not, I feel like the Gear VR is going to be left behind because it only works with yeah. Samsung. Whereas but I, doesn't Oculus only work with Windows? Uh, Computer? Yeah, I think so, but everybody has Windows computers. It's not the same split as Android. I don't. Is that the, this is basically Oculus. If Oculus Rift only worked with HP Windows computers, no, I know. That's but I know. But I'm saying I, I'm I'm thinking about practically me, Jenny Josephson. How will I get VR the fastest? And well, yeah, Gear VR right now is the fastest. Yeah. I'm just talking about its future proofness. No, I I get that, but I um, I guess for me, really practically speaking, it will have to come through the PlayStation. Oh, It'll have the to be Sony. Uh, Project Morpheus. What is yeah. it called? PlayStation VR now? Yeah. Sony V? PlayStation VR. Because I will not likely buy a Windows computer for the purpose of Oculus, even though I get weird, fetchy, grabby need for it every once in a while. But, but since I already have a PlayStation 4, that seems much more likely. So I guess I'm just waiting for Sony. Or the HTC, well, you don't have any Windows computers at all? No. The oh. last Windows computer yeah. we had was a get, long get, time ago. Get a power, more powerful computer if you want to do VR. Yeah, no. Macs aren't good enough. I know. Well, except for the Pro, but I don't think they're even going to bother Yeah. supporting it. Um, but doesn't that mean weird things for Apple computers in the future? If they presume that VR is going to be useful? Or do they think um, it's only going to be useful for games? That, this is a storied conversation about why isn't Apple adopting this technology and why mm-hmm. is it adopting this other technology? And Apple seems to survive somehow. Yeah. Uh, it's, it goes back to what we were talking about with Apple and gaming with Patrick. Yeah. That, that's what I, that's yeah. what I think. I, I don't ever use an Apple computer to game. I'm, just, I'm so console-centric. If, if virtual reality gets to the point where everyone wants it, Apple will have a solution somehow. Yeah, they'll purchase or... It'll either be, we've di- we are now supporting, we, you know, we're yeah. bringing out our friends from Oculus. You know, mm-hmm. it'll be that. Or they'll have their own, they'll, their own solution somehow. And like you say, they'll either buy somebody or make yeah. it. Well, that'll be interesting. I am. Um, yeah, I really want VR in my life so badly, but I don't want to pay what I think I'm going to have to pay for the first iteration of Oculus. Yeah, it's not going to be cheap. Well, if you get a computer, you're gonna have, you're gonna try it on a PC. Yeah. You have to front up for like pretty expensive video card to go. Yeah, with. I mean that's the other thing. It's even just just you can't go buy a yeah. a thin and light Windows laptop yeah. and expect to run the Oculus. All right, either. come on, Sony, <laughs> you can do it. All right. Well, thanks everybody for watching. I'm just going to finish up uploading here, but I hope you all have a good day. Y'all have fun now here. We'll see you later.